I was looking at my clock and I was like, it's still 12.59. Okay, thanks everybody for being here. I'm so excited to welcome you to this first event of the Evergreen 2024 International Online Conference. And even more happy to remind you that this conference would not be possible without help from our sponsors. Um, and so uh, we have uh, in particular uh, the champion sponsors who we're gonna be uh, thanking throughout the event, Equinox Open Library Initiative for sponsoring our Feedloop platform, the Evergreen Community Development Initiative for sponsoring our uh, live captioning, which is always very helpful. And uh, um, then because it is the pre-conference day, we are also thanking Stack Courier and Mobius for bringing special support to our pre-conferences. And if anybody needs anything, please feel free to uh, message me on Feedloop or here in the Zoom uh, chat, and I will try to get any uh, technical issues sorted. I'm so happy to have Ruth Fraser Davis from Evergreen Indiana and the Evergreen Community Development Initiative, as well as Samantha O'Connor from the North Carolina Cardinal Consortium here today to chat with us. And when I say chat, I mean, give us a workout because this is Acquisitions Bootcamp. I am going to stop sharing my screen so that we can share. Uh, hmm. Make sure that all of the sounds are correct. Okay. All right, Katie, are you ready for us to hit it? Take it away. Awesome. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I am, as Katie has already said, Ruth Fraser Davis and Samantha O'Connor is here from NC Cardinals, their training specialist. I was formerly known as the coordinator for Evergreen Indiana. Well, I guess I still am. There'll be an announcement pretty soon because we have a new director, but that's not what the, we're here for. So we're gonna get started with several things and, um, but I'm gonna let Samantha, if you wanna introduce yourself first um, and why you wanted to talk about acquisitions. Uh, sure. Um, so I'm Samantha O'Connor. I am the training specialist for NC Cardinal. And I guess I wanted to talk about acquisitions because acquisitions is still kind of scary. And I've basically spent the last year troubleshooting a sort of an endless stream of different things. Um, and I've learned a lot about kind of how acquisitions is fit, fits together and some of the different ways that it can be broken um, through this process. And I guess I just wanted to kind of share that with others that may be running into the same things or maybe a little bit mystified by acquisitions and scared to dive into it. And so maybe by taking a look at some of the issues that come up and the ways that you can fix them might help to demystify that a little bit. Awesome. Thank you, Samantha. And I always want to talk about acquisitions, even though it is, a, as has been characterized a couple of times, a little bit scary, can be very overwhelming. Um, hopefully, we can demystify it a little bit for you today. Um, but I will say, too, this is going to be a lot of content. Uh, please take advantage of um, the resources that we have. And I'm going to attempt to, when I am quiet, I'm going to uh, put a link, let me check chat real quickly. Yeah, into chat so that Katie can get that and put it into the feed loop chat that has to do with our, um, our actual slide deck. Let me go back and get that real quickly. So that you have access to that. We're gonna, here's a brief overview of what we're gonna be looking at. Uh, we're going to kind of see how all the pieces work together, um, how you might use those things in your library, how to get it set up, and then what daily workflows might look like, and some more things. So 
this is going to be our agenda. Let me quickly share that link with Katie to go over into feed loop. Okay. So uh, I also want to thank Samantha so much for uh, getting in here and doing like the first like stab of, of everything uh, that needs to be talked about. Um, and then I went in and just like started making little things in Google Slides to get an idea about acquisitions. But the first thing that I would like you all to recognize is the fact that you already do acquisitions, at least some component of it in your library if you work in a library. And, and these are um, obviously not the technical terms for any of these things. We've got a little few more technical terms in the middle, but you do acquisitions because acquisitions is the acquiring of things that you're going to prepare for people to borrow from your lending libraries. But we do it in all sorts of different ways. I've seen libraries that take uh, review magazines and they send them around to different department heads and they read them and they check them and they come back into it, have a meeting and then they um, figure out who's gonna go into Baker and Taylor to put things into a cart. And then they also look at the carts and it, this is all very confusing. They have paper for the patron requests. Uh, and then what do we do with invoices and how do we keep track of all that? Acquisitions within your integrated library system, and we're talking about Evergreen as your integrated li library system, provides the tools for you to keep track of all that, make it more efficient, keep it in one place um, so that it can move faster, move more reliably through your library system and give you time to do some other things eventually once it's set up and ready to go. So let's take a look very quickly at all of the pieces. Um, and I think looking at these pieces, of course, I'm a visually oriented person. I, I don't know if Samantha, when you kind of looked at this, what was your impression? Did you feel like overwhelm or did you feel like, oh, that's cool, I understand, whatever. I mean, I think, you know, initially it was a little overwhelming because there are a lot of pieces, but once I, once I stepped past feeling overwhelmed, it made sense, if that, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I whole, wholeheartedly agree because I have not used acquisitions in a library as the tool. Um, I have used it uh, in testing, um, worked on development projects. I have used it like to do like intellectual exercises. Um, I put together training, so having to step through all those things. And I have worked with libraries that are using it on their workflows. Uh, so I kind of feel like I came at it a little bit like sideways um, rather than saying, okay, this is my library. These are what we want to do and just picking the workflows, which I think I could be wrong. And please, uh, Samantha, I, I want your, your opinion about that too. Um, that when you go in with a mindset of how you want it to do, it becomes a little bit, I want to say easier, but you come, come, become more focused on picking out the tools that you want to use. Does that? Yeah, I think when you're in a situation like us where you're kind of looking at everything that Acquisitions has to offer, seeing how those pieces fit together, it doesn't necessarily make sense up front. But when you you know, when I've worked with libraries that are setting it up or using it, that's when it you start to see the flow from one piece to another, and that's when it makes more sense. I like that. Thanks. That actually also like makes me feel even better about acquisitions. <laughs> so I want to give a little description of what this graphic um, means. So uh, when you are uh, looking at this probably, unless you have some experience with acquisitions, it might look like a bit of gobbledygook with some cute colors. Um, but up here at the top, we have uh, funding sources, funds, providers, and ED accounts. So those are 
essentially, and there are more administrative uh, pieces, but those are the administrative things that need to be set up before you can run acquisitions as a, as a full tool in your library. And then next to that, you can see we have acquisitions search, uh, which is a very important uh, component for navigating uh, between things and of course, referring back to um, acquisitions files. I'm gonna call files for just a moment before I start calling them something else. Uh, and then we have helper tools. I, I call these helper tools, at least in my head, uh, being holdings, import profiles and distribution uh, formulas. Think about them in the same way that you might think about templates, um, whether that be in Evergreen, there are lots of templates in Evergreen, but templates in general, I think of holdings import profiles as well as the distribution formulas along the same vein as templates. And then this bottom part, um, I, I was hoping to uh, put like arrows in here. And then I realized that so many of these tools go back and forth with one another. And depending on what your workflow is, you might have something like you may have a selection list go to a purchase order. You may have a, um, you may deal with the purchase order for receiving, uh, but you may deal with line items depending on what your workflow is. So I kind of tried to group these a little bit going from the collection development part of the acquisitions, just the idea going back to this slide, we have collection development, bookkeeping, circulation, cataloging. Um, to go back into that, so we have collection development here. Uh, this is a very, very broad thing where it says collection development strategy, and then patron requests, which you may or may not do in your library, and then going further along in this process to um, different types of records. Uh, where do you get them from? Do you create them? Do you get them from a vendor? Do you get them from the catalog? Uh, moving on, we're gonna talk also about, we have catalog records, but then we need to look from those, there are things, like catalog records describe things. So we have holdings. And then how do these things become purchase orders for ordering and then receiving, and also creating those holdings records in the system so that, Patrons can place hold on it, hold on it. And then going further down here, finally get those things. We have received them, invoicing, we pay for them. Uh, but we receive them, then they become cataloged in our tech services department, whatever that means in your library. It could be your tech services person, it could be a full fleshed department of multiple people. And then ultimately this thing is going out into circulation. So acquisitions takes your collection development strategy and takes it all the way from that conceptual, I, I want to get this thing, how do I determine what the thing is, all the way to that when that thing is in a state that it is able to then be lent or used by your library users. Is there anything here, Samantha, that you want to add to this right no, now? No, I think that's a that's a really good explanation. I, that I think that that's a really clear way to put it. Thank you. I struggled. I struggled a lot, and I was like, "Oh, I'll just make boxes. Maybe that will help." Um, and the other thing that I I do you want to say, and, and I say this in training, I have a suspicion that Samantha, you have said this in training. When we talk about Evergreen, we talk about this ILS being an integrated library system. It is my belief that acquisitions is an integrated library system within an integrated library system. So it has its own level of complexity, um, not quite as much as the entire ILS, but it is kind of complex. I mean, looking at this and you can go use this tool, you can access it through a menu, whatever. Uh, so if you do feel overwhelmed, why do I say all that? If you do feel overwhelmed, that is valid because this 
is a lot. Does that mean that you cannot do it? Absolutely not. It's like anything else. You just pick a thing and pick another thing and you just keep going. And if you need to make that thing a little bit smaller, that's fine. If you need to get for help for that, that's great. All of those things. You have used the ILS. You can use acquisitions. You already know how to acquire things. It's just putting the tools to that within Evergreen. Okay. The best way to avoid, well, not avoid, to mitigate the overwhelm is to before you ever think about, well, not before you think about, before you ever do anything with the tools in acquisitions is that you uh, make a plan. And I have this linked, it is also linked in, in the um, PDF slides that were shared there. This is to a planning document um, and Samantha had mentioned that, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna borrow that or take that and use that. Please do. I don't know where this came from. It might have been something that was generated in Evergreen, Indiana. It might have been generated somewhere else. We use it religiously in Evergreen, Indiana, um, at a, as an admin um, tool, whether or not our libraries use it or not, that's up to them. But it's a way to start mapping things. Who's going to be involved in this process? What are the funding sources, which we'll talk about in a second? What are the funds, providers? When you can get this filled out, even if it's incomplete, doesn't have to be complete, it's going to start helping you not have to struggle so hard when you get into the software, because in the software, you then you're just gonna be filling out forms and putting things in. And that's a lot easier than trying to go and grab everything from different files all over the place to fill in the forms and then getting really frustrated when you lost that one file and you have to go back in here and do it again. Plan beforehand, use that spreadsheet, change it, share it, give it away at Christmas, whatever you want to do. I know it's sad, but I am giving Excel formulas for Christmas. Be prepared. So we got to have a plan. This requires communication in your library. It involves getting more than one person on board. There has to be buy-in um, and institutional um, empowerment to use this tool. It is a great way to start talking about collection development in your library, between departments, um, amongst your colleagues. That is going to be probably the most important thing that you do, those conversations and the plan. And then we come to the software. And the first thing we do is we get it set up, be prepared. I added little starbursts in this one. You have a bunch of things to fill out. So I'm gonna very quickly from here, uh, move this Zoom admin bar over and I'm going to open, I have no idea why these things showed up on my browser, just FYI, just gives it to me. I'm gonna to go to Evergreen, Indiana, to the staff client. Since we are not using, looking at patron data right now, I do not have any worries about that. Um, and I think that when we get into troubleshooting and, and potentially get into seeing patron data, Samantha's gonna be doing that. So, so I'm not concerned. So set up in the administration menu. And this is of course, is in our localized one, but if you are um, in yours, it's still gonna be in the administration menu, acquisitions administration. And you are going to set up at least your fund administration and your providers, um, depending on what you're doing in your library, you may also be setting up EDI accounts um, as well as attribute sets that go along with that. But at the very least, you're going to be setting up funds, 
doing fund administration and then providers. In fund administration, um, and, and I, I have a personal preference that not everybody agrees with, I wish that funding sources was before funds because before you can uh, have money in funds, you have to have money in funding sources because that's where the money comes from. Every library is going to have an operating fund, whatever the line item is, whatever you call it, that's gonna be in here, but you may also have uh, many others. And I'm going to just go to uh, one of our libraries, Morrison Reeves. You can see here that they have multiple funding sources. Some of those uh, have money that's added at the beginning of the fiscal year. Some of them don't. Um, there are some memorial funds in here, uh, also a couple different ways. And they've decided how they did this. Um, operating budget for print materials, operating budget for non-print in your library. This may be just one big old bucket. I'm going to take a look also at Porter County. And you can see here, they have one funding source for operating and they put all the money in there. And, and from there then, they can start funding their funds. So I'm gonna go back to Morrison Reeves. This is a little bit of trial and error because they, they are not in this yet. So here we have uh, what funds they have. Now, I do want to make a point here to say that funds in accounting are different than funds in evergreen acquisitions. Funds in evergreen acquisitions are ways that you can spend money on certain things within your collection. A lot of times, funds in accounting are actually referring to funding sources. So make sure that when you're thinking, like if there's a memorial fund, that is actually a funding source in Evergreen that you're going to then um, send money to. And I'm going to actually open one of these up here. You can create allocations from a funding source that, and you can see here, there's a funding source right here and it allocated money to this non-print AV fund. So, so we have these parts of admin and there are other things in here. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time going through, but then we also have our providers and that's where you're gonna get the stuff from. Uh, I'm gonna do a big old list. And let's go ahead and search. And of course, I want to make it bigger because I just do, because I like long lists. Save that. And you can see all of the providers that have been added in here from our various acquisition libraries. And you can see that even we have many Baker and Taylor in here, but there are different uh, reasons why they have been added in, in here. And Kate, so we have provider of leased materials, AV materials, and this is for Jackson County. Things that are not going through EDI because they are using EDI, which we'll talk about very briefly. Um, so providers and fund administration are the um, big things, but then all of these things as well. And I put this uh, little starburst here. So don't forget, there's also library settings. I don't have them listed here but know that they're in there and most of them begin with the word acquisitions. Um, if you do a search in library settings, and I can just, and I actually like to start here with just ACQ and, and I didn't make a point to point out uh, Bill the Cat earlier in our slides was in there because his trademark thing to say is ACK. And we often refer to acquisitions as ACK. I'm not sure if that's a great thing or not, but you can start putting that in here. And I'm going to expand that as well. And you can see there are a lot of things in here that give you options. Now, 
you can see over here the context and the value, not everything is filled out. You decide what works for your library. Again, this is a tool amongst all the other tools that you have to use. Uh, Samantha, what, what am I missing here? Um, the, or anything? <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, I, I think this is the basics of it. Um, you know, there's some details in setting up all that stuff that you could get into, but I don't know how deep you want to go on it. I think you covered everything. I would love to go super deep into all of it, but we only have two hours. Um, and so, you know, best. you know, at the end, we're going to be like, <laughs> read the documentation. Here's so much documentation and also the acquisitions interest group. Um, <laughs> because they're, because this is, of course, like the boot camp, camp is to say, look at all this stuff, and this is what it involves. And um, if we were doing a four hour boot camp, we'd be having you set this up on a test server. Um, and yeah, anyway, but it's not, it's two hours. So, okay. And then we start thinking about the daily workflow options. Uh, Samantha, you want to talk about this a little bit here? Sure. Um, so really, when we're talking about the daily workflow, um, that doesn't necessarily mean anything specific, because the daily workflow can be different, depending on how your library wants to do it. Um, so these are really all of the different tasks that are related to the actual process of selecting and ordering and receiving and paying for. So all that admin stuff is setting up the foundation for how the money goes where um, and how things are connected. But on a daily basis, the work you're going to be doing really isn't going to touch those funds and funding sources and everything. It's going to go into the actual process of, as Ruth had in her chart earlier, taking the idea of things that you want to get and moving them through a process that results in them being able to circulate to your, to your patrons. Um, and there are a lot of different options for this. Um, so you really do have the flexibility to set it up the way that works best for you, whether that's the closest to the way you did it before starting to use acquisitions within Evergreen or whether it is just the thing that makes sense based on how how many staff you have and how closely they work together. Um, one of the things that's really nice about this is this flexibility, but it does make it kind of difficult to, you know, to say, well, this is, these are the steps that you have to do for everything because every library does it a little differently. Um, you have the option to select your materials using selection lists um, within Evergreen. And so you can kind of go through your existing catalog, uh, see what other systems within your consortium own and see which of those you want to buy and put them on a selection list. Um, you can also, you know, do your selecting completely within your vendor site. So you can go to Ingram or Baker and Taylor and create your carts there without ever looking at Evergreen until you're ready to move that selection as a purchase order into Evergreen. Um, you can get records from your vendor. You can use the existing records in the catalog. You could create the records yourself if you were so inclined. Um, you can get your purchase orders um, into Evergreen by creating them manually, or you can create them via an upload of records. So if you get your records from your vendors, you can take those records, upload them into the acquisitions module, and create a purchase order through that upload process. So the uploader is very similar to the cataloging uploader, but it allows you to create a purchase order through the process of doing it. Um, you also have the ability, if you're in a really large system, to do very centralized uh, ordering, or you can do it where sort of each branch has the ability to make all of their choices themselves. Um, so there are a lot of options that allow you to determine kind of who is a selector, who can approve a purchase, who can actually make a purchase. Um, there are a lot of different options there. Um, I would say with an NC Cardinal, the most common thing is to um, create the selections at the vendor's website and then upload them into into Evergreen via the batch uploader. Um, but we definitely have libraries that start from selection lists. We have uh, libraries that do everything 
um, kind of without EDI. And so they're really just kind of using acquisitions as a way to keep track of things. And then we do have a lot of libraries that utilize EDI. And we'll talk about what that is a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but EDI does allow you to automate a lot of this stuff, basically to take those purchase orders that you create in Evergreen and then send them electronically to your vendor to actually um, trigger the creation of that order. And then on the other end of things for your vendor to be able to send you invoices back through that same electronic channel, um, which is just you know, a little bit of a more efficient way to place those orders, but there's certainly, you can certainly make acquisitions work for you without that. So all of this is to say that the daily workflow is not a simple set of like four or five steps that everyone follows. It's a variety of different options that your library can, can choose um, in order to kind of um, use the functions that work for you. Um, and then, you know, that may be different depending on which vendor you're working with. It may be different depending on, um, you know, which funds you're working with, but it's very flexible is really what it comes down to. Um, it does offer the option to a certain extent to integrate patron purchase requests. Um, it's not this wonderfully completely automatic thing where a patron requests something and that request goes straight into some sort of selection list. Um, but it does allow you to take patron requests and sort of flag them as you're making moving through the purchasing process so and place holds on them so that your patron, once that item is received, um, it will automatically go on hold for that patron. Um, so, and I, I want to jump in here real quickly and, um, and, and agree with Samantha uh, that the, what we see the most often in Evergreen, Indiana, um, whether or not a library uses EDI, because you don't have to uh, in this, is that, and I'm gonna use Baker and Taylor as an example um, because they're well known, but they are not the only ones that do this. I believe that Ingram has a similar process. Um, Brodart, if you use Brodart, may as well. Um, Midwest Tape does. Um, where you can go in and uh, create carts. You can also within there by working with their staff, uh, you can um, have holdings attributes mapped um, so that when you get records from them, uh, based on the carts that you create, it can already help you to, to create items um, in Evergreen's acquisitions. And what that does when you have those items, it, because that is how you get those patrons to now be able to place holds on things that are not yet in your library. So, so they're placing holds on on order things. But we see that the most often, that um, those um, people are doing selection in the vendor website they're downloading those carts essentially, and then they're uploading those to Evergreen to create uh, a purchase order. But you can also, depending on what permissions you have, and all of these things are gonna have a permissions component to them. Again, reiterating what Samantha said, rather than do a purchase order, you can also do a selection list from there, uh, from uploading that cart rather than a purchase order because the purchase order is like the next, it's the thing before you buy the things. Um, but the selection list gives another step in there for collaboration, for making the case why we need this thing. Um, and if you have many selectors in your organization, whatever that organization is, uh, that may be something we, we also have very few libraries in Evergreen, Indiana that use selection lists because they go directly to the purchase order um, phase in that. Do you find that in NC Cardinal, Samantha, or do you experience something a little bit broader than that? No, that's that's really similar to what we see in NC Cardinal. Um, the libraries that we have that do use selection lists, for the most part, what they're doing is they're 
basically doing centralized ordering, but decentralized selecting. So like somebody at each branch will be putting together a list of what that branch wants to purchase. And they do that within selection lists. And then they make those selection lists uh, ready for order. And that sends it to the person at the at the central branch who basically takes a look at it, determines what's going to be ordered and what's not, and which vendors to go through and all of that. And then they actually create the purchase order from those selection lists. So selection lists, for the most part, are used when there's sort of this um, decentralized process of selection where branches really get to have a say in what they'd like to purchase, but the ordering itself is happening in a central location. I like to think of this as, as a, a way, this is, there is no panacea for what I'm about to say next, just, just so you know. Um, but when we introduce complexity into any system, so if there's more than one person that's picking something out, we have introduced complexity. Now, if we scale that to 15 people, we have introduced complexity. And there's a point where complexity looks a little bit like chaos. And, and so what this allows you to do is first of all, to define some of the complexity and make some semblance of order out of chaos. Um, now I know chaos is a little bit more extreme than that, but this, this is how I think about it, that we introduce complexity when we include more voices in a conversation. There's nothing wrong with that, it's amazing. There should be more voices, in my opinion at least, uh, but we have to have a way to manage that. And this, these tools allow you to manage that. So I'm gonna go back and revisit this again real quickly and say, there are things that you have to have, right? You have to have funding sources and, and you have to have funds, whether they align to anything in the real world or not. You have to have providers because you're getting your things from somewhere. Beyond that, you don't necessarily need to use and you will not probably use all of these tools in, there may be a line that's missing on this graph. Um, but I do want to go back to, and I'm not gonna put the link back in and I'm not gonna go back to the spreadsheet, but there is a tab on that spreadsheet that says workflows. And that tab has nothing to do with the tools that are in Evergreen. That has to do with how you want to envision the process happening in your library. There's some examples in there. Back them out, make that your own, make that uh, uh, what works for your library. Okay. Um, it looks like we did have a question come through and it's okay. been answered in chat, but I just wanted to say it out loud just in case anybody is not yes, watching the chat. Um, it would just, if a record already exists when you're when you're uploading it, is it gonna merge? Um, and yes, it will. Um, you can set up a merge profile just like you do with your cataloging uploader and um, make sure that your records are merging as they're coming in. I think that's a like the perfect segue into this. Because <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there are some tools uh, that you can use and, and I am going to pop back out uh, to um, acquisitions administration here. No, it's not actually what I want. I actually want to go into local, yeah, local administration. And I take it all back. That's, I'm just going to go to the batch import export tool. There's a way you can get to this through administration, but I'm just going to go directly. Um, there are a couple things in here that you can utilize. Um, and there is the rack, record match sets, which is what um, and also the merge overlay profiles, uh, although this is for bibs, but then also holdings import profiles. And what this is going to do here is this is going to take that information that was mapped, holdings information that, that was mapped in your vendor cart, and it is going to use it to create items in uh, the acquisitions module and then eventually in the cataloging module and I'm, I'm going to actually go over here to load mark order and this is where you could select um, your merge profile you can see what we have here in evergreen indiana um, and i'm looking right past what i what i want to see here 
Hmm. I'm not going to worry about it right now. Merge profile record match set. Okay. And I'm also, this is, I should never read the chat unless somebody says, look at the chat because I get too distracted. Um, I, I am in love with holdings import profiles. I don't know a better way to say that. It is just the truth of the matter. Um, anyway, anybody want to say anything about that? Is it weird? Probably a little bit weird. What I, mean, I know, know that I am in love with them, but I have a great deal of admiration for them. Yeah, I have very deep emotions, Samantha. It's a little inappropriate at times. That's okay. And then we're, we've talked about, we've mentioned EDI um, and Samantha has honestly given a really good overview of what that is. Of course, it means electronic data interchange. It is not unique to Evergreen. It is not unique to libraries. Um, it is a protocol for sending information over the internet. Um, there are, of course, the tools if you want to do this, uh, tools in Evergreen to set it up. It does require having communication with your vendor. And I mean, on the one hand, maybe that's like feels like a bit of a duh. But on the other hand, I'm speaking for myself. I don't always like to talk to my vendors, especially if they have an automated cart that I feel like should like do all of the things. But this requires oftentimes either an email a conversation say hey we're going to do this what do we need to know um, there are some um, server not server there's some folder destinations and things like that that need to be um, set up and then the flow of information needs to begin and the, the, so that's that is an electronic connection between evergreen and uh, the vendor's servers so that we can send messages back and forth, place orders, they send invoices, all these things. Uh, this is the list of EDI providers that I know about, but I feel like there might be more. Uh, Baker and Taylor and Midwest Tape are the ones that we deal with the most in Evergreen. Indiana Ingram is coming in hot because of the troubled times with Baker and Taylor. And I know that that Brodart does as well, um, but who, and now I do see some chat things, ULS and White Hots in Canada. Um, so the acquisition load mark order records could replace the, the um, not, mm, Simone, that's a great question. Let me actually read the entire question out loud rather than just like making grunty sounds. Uh, so the acquisition load mark order records could replace using the mark batch import export module under cataloging. For acquisitions records, yes. And I, I don't know, there may be people who are using um, mark batch import export for acquisition records. So when I talk about troubleshooting, I'm going to talk about how those two things um, talk to each other, essentially. Um, yes, you could, if you adopted acquisitions, get all your records in via the acquisitions uploader and then do a lot of manual work to get things ready for cataloging. Most likely you're still going to want to use the catalog uploader um, to kind of finish the process. Um, oh, that's a great way to describe it. Um, yeah, because uh, yeah. basically you're creating an acquisitions record, um, which is a bib record, um, but it has some kind of placeholder data in it. And generally speaking, it's a fairly brief record that you get at the point of selecting items from your vendor. You're going to get a much fuller record at the point of actual like purchase and receiving. And you also are going to get like your final barcode and stuff like that. And it's a lot easier to upload that in batch and we'll talk a little bit when we're troubleshooting in how that works and how sometimes it can cause some problems but um it's faster and easier to do that in batch using the batch uploader than it is to do it manually but it is possible to do it manually and um i'm gonna answer Karen's question real quickly. Ingram is transitioning to only doing EDI over SFTP, 
not FTP? Does Evergreen allow for SFTP transfers? Um, from what I know right now, and I know Tiffany is in here, um, maybe. Okay, I know that there was work being done to have that uh, mitigated, but I wasn't sure what the um, status was. And I see here now, oh, look at all these people putting all the things in here. Uh, <laughs> um, so we did that transfer for Ingram two weeks ago. Fantastic. So it works for Ingram. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> awesome. I'm just watching the chat, the chat roll now. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. Um, so the next slide on says, let's take a break. Um, which we're gonna do, but before we take a break, anything else uh, that you wanna say, Samantha, right now, or questions that are like hot on somebody's mind? I don't have anything to add right now, but I'm happy to answer questions, so. So you could basically upload on order records via acquisitions and full marks via cataloging. Yes. And oh, that is the other thing that I wanted to say. Yes, that is correct, Simone. And uh, that is what happens more often in Evergreen, Indiana, because of the nature of our cataloging um, that on order records do generally go in through acquisitions and then they merge. Uh, but uh, there are a lot more hands that get on those records um, after they are ordered um, because we do not have centralized cataloging. And so somebody could put in an on-order record from one library and then um, another library could put in an on-order record from their library, but it merges and so we now have uh, these items on that one record that is still an on-order record, but then somehow or other, some library that doesn't even use acquisitions gets hold of the thing in their hand and they are hot on it and they get in and they do full cataloging on it and add their item to it. And so we uh, very often find that we're doing um, cataloging, not necessarily from Mark Batch Import Export, but from the staff catalog and search, um, but also through, uh, through the batch uploader, um, cataloging batch uploader. I, I'm trying to avoid saying Vandalite, but there I said it and now I feel better. Okay. Um, it, it flows very fluidly, I will say, in Evergreen, Indiana, so. Oh, I'm glad that made sense because I felt like I was going off the rails. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and let's take a break. And how, how long were you thinking for the break, Samantha? Um, is 10 minutes long enough? I think so. All right, let's do 10 minutes. Cool. We will see you all back here at, oh, let's do 13 minutes at 2 p.m. Okay. Just to you know, round it up. <laughs> all right. Katie, do you need to put the interstitial slides up in the break or not? You know, I don't know. I can. Well, <laughs> well, I, mean, I don't think so. I think it's better if if there's the break yeah. one. Okay. So, thanks again to our sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks sponsors. <laughs> okay, cool, thanks.
you know what, I take it all back. I think that it should be you because then uh, Samantha's gonna come back and she's gonna share her screen. Okay. Okay, let me, let me unshare and whoever can see all of the craziness of the, um, well, I'm also not very good at any of these things. So here we go.
Katie, I can take over the screen share whenever you want to disable it, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm back. I'm ready. Perfect. All right. Now I have to see if I can remember how to do the exact version of a screen share I want to do here. Oh, you're muted, Ruth. You're still muted, but I love your mug. That's cool. I can listen to my talk myself talk twice. <laughs> I'm very proud of my water bottle that has a sticker that says prepare for the apocalypse. <laughs> That's it. That's what I wanted to share. You're welcome. Samantha, I do think you will want to open up Zoom directly. Okay. Here we go. All right. Is it you're seeing the acquisitions three point now? I'm still oh, seeing yet. I'm no? still seeing the notice that you've started screen sharing. <laughs> okay. Are um, you are you in feed loop or are you in Zoom? I'm in feed loop. Okay. So Let me um, throw you the invitation so that you can hop on over here. It's kind of confusing. Yeah. I mean, it works. I like I... Hello all, welcome back. We'll get going in just, just a minute. As most of you are probably experiencing as well, not all of you, but most of you, this is a new platform for us this year. And it works. <laughs> oh. Oh boy. Yeah. It's big, but <laughs> I got it's it. Big, I'm, but just, I'm trying. I'm doing a I'm doing a portion of screen share. Oh, 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 perfect. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> so great. I have to get the right portion in the screen, or else yeah. it just looks weird. All right. That so looks... now you see just acquisitions three point now. Hopefully. Yep. Awesome. Okay. All right. Welcome back from our lunch break, everybody. Thanks for hanging with us. And <laughs> I can tell this is going to be good because <laughs> that's awesome. All right. Thank you, Ruth and Samantha. Take it away. So I'm going to go into this right now uh, and take off my Evergreen Indiana hat for a moment and put on my Evergreen Community Development Initiative hat, uh, which I am the coordinator for. And uh, one of the things, and, and this is kind of crazy, but it is the way that it is, um, is that when I started that job, which was in 2019, um, I was doing something different with Evergreen Indiana, but I have been with ECDI for, for that long. I um, inherited the, this acquisitions project and um, it has been ongoing. And I am just so proud of the work that this entire community has done to build out the um, functionality of the acquisitions toolkit and um, all the testing that has gone into it. And we have just gotten to the point, we're gonna be talking uh, in, in just a second uh, about um, where we're going, where we're almost completely done getting rid of Dojo. So Dojo, if you are unaware, is a version of JavaScript, which is a, a web programming language. That's not the right way to say it, but, and, and it worked for a long time. 
um, it didn't work real well on uh, the web interface. And so we've spent literally years since 2019 rewriting all of the interfaces, all of those tools, adding functionality. So what has that meant in the past year or two things? Well, I'm just going to go through the whole thing. Complete rewrites of all of the acquisitions, administration interfaces, uh, search, and there are different types of search that you can go in. There are so many um, things that you can search. Uh, purchase orders, selection lists, line items. And then, um, and Tiffany Little from Georgia Pines is going to forever get a shout out for um, overhauling the load mark order records um, interface. It was her, her first like dev, I, I don't know if it's her first dev like commitment, but it was huge and so proud of that work. Uh, there's also now support for, and I don't know what the DES ADV stands for, it stands for something. Um, it is that it allows libraries, large libraries that get like pallets of books using EDI to check those things in um, and, and messages that allow them to do that. And so many new per permissions and so much more. And yeah, that's right. I had to put in that, that graphic because I just did, that's it. Okay, what's next? So what is coming up? And um, I hope I put a little joke on the screen too. I hope you see it. The promises and the possibilities because until it comes out in a release, we just never really know. But um, what is coming next? Also complete rewrite of invoicing, claiming, the Mark Federated Search, um, which is what it's called in acquisitions, but also then the um, angularization, the new angularization of Z3950, which is what it's called in cataloging. Same interface, there's some tweaks depending on how you access it. One is bent towards acquisitions, one towards cataloging. Um, angularization of the ability to load catalog record IDs. Um, new brief records, which is a little bit of a chef's kiss, I think. And then so many bug fixes, new permissions, um, links within the software to get to other places. And, and I like this maybe because I'm a nerd. I don't know. Background uploads so that you can get the thing going, go do something else, and it will actually email you when it is done uploading. So you don't have to maybe sit it. Um, I'm not sure that I should use that word. That's why I'm kind of like backing off from it. So many things here, um, but we all know we're, we're here for this next part, which is the troubleshooting. And Samantha is a professional <laughs> troubleshooter. <laughs> I, I, I love it. That might My be first reaction is to time. be like, oh, her reaction is we can fix that. Yeah. Yes, that is accurate every time. Um, <laughs> all right. So we're going to talk about troubleshooting because as much as we can talk about all the great things that acquisitions can do for your library, the reality is that it does not always happen smoothly. And I think it's important at this point to be honest about what, what can go wrong um, and to tell you that there are ways to handle it when things go wrong. It's not just a throw your hands up in the air situation. A lot of the things that happen, happen for fairly straightforward reasons and are a fairly straightforward fix. And that's mostly what we'll talk about today. The really crazy things that can come up, we won't get into great detail on, but if anybody wants some stories, I've got a few. Um, but we're going to stick to mostly the, the things that you're very likely to encounter. Um, and so we're going to look at mostly common problems um, because, you know, because they're common, because they're something that you're going to see happening. Um, really, one of the things that I like about the acquisitions within Evergreen is that it's really flexible. And we talked about that earlier. You can really take the different pieces of it and apply them in your library setting in the way that works best for you, um, whether that is 
um, depending on your vendor or the way your governing body wants you to do your bookkeeping, there are a lot of different options for how you can set it up. The problem that comes out of that is that the more flexible you make something, the harder it is to build real fail safes into things. So, you know, if there's a very strict, there's only one way to do this, then when you don't do it, it doesn't work. And you know why it didn't work and you then go back and do it the way you were supposed to. But when it's super flexible like this, sometimes the, the thing that breaks everything, you don't realize what happened until three or four steps down the road. Um, so that's kind of where a lot of these problems tend to come in, um, is, is figuring out once something's not working, backtracking to figure out what, what the um, action was that caused that in the first place and then fixing it. Um, so one of the most common issues that we see with acquisitions is purchase orders that won't activate. Um, and most of the issues that do come through acquisitions, I find do originate at the purchase order level. There are things that happen in invoices. There are things that happen in selection lists, but the majority of the tickets that I see um, are coming at the purchase order uh, point. So that's where a lot of this focus is gonna be. That's what we're gonna be looking at a lot today. Um, since the 3.10 upgrade, um, a lot of these issues have been a little bit demystified. You get a lot more details now about why a purchase order is not activating than you used to. And sometimes you even get those details before you attempt to activate. So you know that you're not gonna be able to activate it. And that's a huge improvement. Um, so we're just gonna kind of look at what some of those are and we're gonna look at how you can fix them. Um, the simplest reason that a purchase order won't activate is a missing price. Um, it's not necessarily the most common reason, but it's the easiest one to find and fix. Um, so let's take a look at a PO that has a missing price. So um, this one's nice and easy. There's only three items on it. We can see up here in the status that our status is one or more line items have no price. So I cannot activate this. I don't even have a button that allows me to activate it. Those of you who have not yet started using acquisitions and are just kind of curious, um, the, this is what a purchase order looks like. And this is um, really kind of the nexus of a lot of what you'll be doing in your daily workflow, regardless of how you're making your selections and whether or not you're using EDI, purchase orders will always be part of it. Um, and so this is where you'll be spending a great deal of time. Um, in order to take a purchase order from just a list of things you want, to a list of things you're actually ordering, you have to activate it. And when that activation isn't possible, you have to fix that problem before you can move forward. So in this case, the problem that we're seeing is that the there's something missing a price. Now in a really long purchase order, this one's only three items, but in a longer one, um, one suggestion I have is that you do a nice little control F and you search for zero, dot zero zero estimated because that's going to bring you to the line item each of these sort of little beige boxes is a line item this will bring you to the line item that has zero dollars estimated for the cost of this item you can see at the one above we've got 2385 as the estimated cost for the item if you have a zero dollar estimated that means there's no price so all you have to do here is put your price in Let's say this is $12. And suddenly if I go back up to the top, it now says it is activatable. And I now have this button that says activate order. So that was a really easy fix. Um, like I said, a missing price is not the most common reason that a purchase order won't activate, but it's definitely one of the easiest ones to fix. Um, now the next easiest thing and a much more common reason is missing copies. And this is fairly similar to that concept of missing price. It's basically, there's a piece of information that is necessary for purchasing something that's not there. In this case, it's the information about what you're actually buying, um, which is, you know, probably important. So this is a different purchase order. And this one, we're getting a status of one or more line items have no items attached. Now, earlier I said that 3.10 is a really big improvement on kind of demystifying activation issues. Previous to 3.10, um, 
the status often didn't tell you a lot. Um, I think price would still show up. Um, and this one may even have shown up, but you didn't generally get a whole lot of information about why something was not activatable. Um, so these status updates are really helpful, I think. Um, what we're looking at here is a, a single line item purchase order, probably fairly uncommon in the real world. Um, but what I'm actually concerned about is not the number of line items, but the number of copies or the number of, of in this case, uh, the terminology being used as items. And that's confusing, I think, for some people that are just moving into acquisitions. Um, I think a lot of libraries kind of start out thinking, well, if there is a title on my purchase order, then obviously I have an item because I wouldn't have all of this stuff. I wouldn't have the ISBN and the title and all of this information if there wasn't an item attached. But I think if you are comfortable with the cataloging interface, you're probably can understand what's going on here in that just like with cataloging, you have sort of a multi-level set of, of records. You have your bibliographic record, and then you have your call number and your item level records. In acquisitions, you have a similar multi-level record situation. You have your line item, which really is the bit that connects to the bibliographic record. But in order to actually make a purchase, you have to purchase copies of that line item. You've said that you want lessons of chem in chemistry, but you haven't said anything about how you want it. And I can see that I have no items attached here in this little icon here. Again, if you have a really long purchase order and you want to find things quickly, um, a control F and a search for items, parentheses zero. Um, oh, there's a space. Uh, we'll get you straight to it. So obviously it's very easy in this case because I just have the one. But um, once you're looking at like 40 or 50 line items, it can be kind of difficult to see where you've got stuff missing. Um, you can expand here and this is going to show you what's actually missing. Um, we know your items are missing, but if you're not familiar with what that means, this basically, we don't know where the copy of this is going to go. We don't know how many copies of it we're getting. We don't know where it'll be shelved once we have it. We don't know what fund we're paying for this out of. We don't know what type of CERC modifier this is. Is it a book or an audio book? Um, we don't have any information about the copies themselves that will be moving into our catalog. Um, so you really have to set that up before you can move forward with your purchase order. And it's fairly easy to do this. Um, we talked about holdings definitions earlier and most libraries do this automatically through the creation of their holdings definition. Typically speaking, if that is how, if uploading items is how you've created your purchase order and you have a line item that doesn't have copies attached, um, it means that something went wrong in your holdings definition. So that's where your troubleshooting kind of has to start. But in order to fix it, you can fix it manually. I'm gonna walk you through that process now and we'll get into the holdings definition in more detail in a minute. So to fix it manually, I'm just gonna click on items and I'm gonna choose first how many copies I actually want of this. So if I get two and I apply that, I now have space to fill in all of these details about two different copies. Now I can have them both at the same owning branch or I can move them to two different owning branches. These libraries aren't even in the same system, so this isn't a good way to do it, but it's how I'm going to do it. Um, I need to uh, set my shelving location and I can do these the same or I can do them different. Collection code is not required. Some libraries use that as part of their sort of record keeping. Fund, however, is very required. These are those funds that Ruth talked about setting up. This is where your money actually comes from and how you're paying for things. Um, um, while yeah. you're doing that as well, I in, in that screen, there is right next to where it says apply, the first, the top one, uh, it says distribution formulas. And, and I just want to uh, point those out again. You may or may not use them. You definitely don't have to. Um, but they are essentially a template that has, that can have this information that Samantha is um, actually putting in there, can have it already pre set up. And that may be part of your workflow. Yeah, this is especially useful if you have um, a really large system and you're typically ordering many, many copies of something. 
um, because you can then sort of have a set, you know, which branches and shelving locations get how many copies as part of this. Um, I'll apply one, but I don't know. I don't work with these a lot, so I'm not sure exactly. And, and yeah. Mary also brings up another uh, good point that it puts me in mind of what can happen. So Mary is talking about, says, I usually use, look at the mark records in the bib queue to see if they have the holdings tag in it. for um, her library's case. They use the 970 really it could have set up in any number of ways. Um, but generally, if you have a holdings tag, it would have generally this is it's supposed to maybe if you have it mapped um it's supposed to create those items right um but only like maybe you didn't have the the box ticked or it didn't have something set up when it uploaded if you use that mechanism that says create items when uploading in those records and so it, even though you had the information it didn't create the items um so there are reasons why that might happen even if you have a holdings tag you might not have a holdings tag. You might just be um, putting straight mark up there without holdings information too. But anyway. Yeah, so basically what that comes down to is that for the most part, your items are getting included with your line items because of your holdings definitions. So if you're seeing that stuff's not, that basically you don't have copies attached, the problem's probably with those, those holding definitions. Um, and there are a couple of different easy ways to check to see whether or not that is, that's the source of it. Um, and I, I do have an, a record that I'm going to upload in a little bit that will not work. And so we'll get to see what happens when your, your holdings definitions are wrong. Um, yes, but it could have been used for those two copies. Um, I, I didn't because I was putting them at two different uh, branches. Although I think when I then apply the distribution formula, I put them both at the same branch. Um, but yes, you can use batch update, which is this sort of grayish box up here at the top where you can choose all of the, all of the sort of um, call number level information and apply it all at once. So this is very similar to what you have um, when you're putting in your call numbers, when you're cataloging. And that would be only, you can use the batch update um if you're making the same change to all the things in the batch yeah uh otherwise if you can do the same change to all, everything in the batch and then go back and edit it um that can sometimes work <laughs> <laughs> yeah um it so it's this is all fairly flexible there are a lot of different ways that you can work through it um one thing to note is that your owning branch, shelving location, fund, and circ modifier are all required. So this will not work if you don't put something in all of those. The call number and barcode are technically required, but there's a library setting that allows you to basically create a placeholder of those. Um, and I think somebody mentioned something about that in the chat. Um, and so you can just leave that blank and the acquisitions module will put a placeholder of that in. Um, when you actually activate your purchase order. Um, and that's something that can cause a whole different host of issues that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but basically you can put in your call number if you know what it is. You can put in your barcode if you know what it is. But in a lot of cases, you know, you don't get your bar, if your vendor attaches your barcode, you don't know what that barcode is going to be at the point of selection. So you probably aren't going to be adding that at this point. And so later, you remember earlier, I talked about the idea of using the um, mark uploader to kind of finish the process. One of the keys of that finishing is actually getting your permanent barcode in um, through that final upload. So there are, once again, lots of different ways this can be done. Um, I think the most common that happens that I see uh, our libraries using is leaving this barcode blank and then overlaying it later on. But you can put in the full barcode at this point if you have it. And obviously you could update it manually if something changes, I suppose. Um, I'm going to go ahead and delete see the most as well, is, is using the library setting to auto-generate um, yeah. the... Yeah, and, and Elizabeth from uh, Pales and Spark is talking about the same thing, using the library settings to auto populate the call number as well as the barcode. Yeah, and yeah. in a minute, we'll look at some, some records where you'll see what that looks like. So I'm gonna go ahead and save those changes. 
and then I'm going to return to my purchase order. And so now I have two items where before I had zero. And if I come up to the top, my status is now pending or activatable. So I could activate this order. Um, and I'll go ahead and do that just so you kind of see what it looks like. Um, not a lot changed except my status is now on order. And later on, when I actually receive these items, I can come and, oh, actually right now, there's probably additional issues where I have to, that I have to deal with, but um, it's encumbered the cost, the full cost. So this is basically encumbered against the fund that I selected. Um, and then once the whole thing is finished, I've received it and the invoice has been paid, then this encumbered amount actually will, would become a debited amount within the fund itself. Ooh, 96 title orders. When I get a ticket <laughs> with that many, I say, well, your first problem is that your purchase order is too big. Nobody right. wants to no book club is that successful. <laughs> All right. So that's um, sort of the second easiest um, problem that comes up with a non-activatable purchase order. So first we had a missing price. That was just a matter of going in and manually adding that price. Then we had missing copies. In the case that we looked at, we manually added the copies. Now, if you do have something like 96 um, copies and none of them have items attached, um, then your problem was probably in your holdings definition. And I would suggest rather than going through and manually adding that for all 96 line items, you actually go on and fix your holdings definitions and re-upload. Um, but you know that's up to you how you wanna spend your time. And so there is a question here from Kate about how big is too big of a PO. And 96 is not too big, but it is generally speaking, we don't have that many items within a line item. Um, so we uh, in Evergreen, Indiana, and I'm going to look pretty quickly, we, we go significantly more than that. Um, it, uh, but I think it does depend also on what interfaces you're using. So a dojo is significantly slower than um, the, the new Angular interfaces. Uh, but we have a couple libraries that do 300, 400 uh, line items per PO. Um, yeah, but I think our... we did talk to them and say, hey, uh, 1,500 is too many. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that gives me heart palpitations. Um, yeah, I think our our recommendation used to be to keep them under 100 um, just because when when it was Dojo, it typically just took too long and often just failed because of the length of time it took. Um, I know we've had libraries that do much larger ones now. Where it becomes a problem is when you do have like one thing is causing an issue, yes. narrowing that down becomes a lot harder the bigger it becomes. And using so. that find um, in the browser <laughs> and those, those just little snippets, string snippets, I was thinking like, oh my goodness, we just need to have like little things just to remind people that they can go through and look for those zero, decimal zero, zero, space, est, uh, to look for that. And then because navigating for that, and, and I was thinking, man, this would be great as a wish list bug to show all the items that don't, the line items that don't have items in it, show all the line items that don't have price in them, uh, rather than having to do the, the scroll and hope. Um, but the find, is there a difference in how many lines in the PO uh, versus the total number of items? Um, there is, um, but I will say that in terms of performance in the interfaces, it has more to do with the number of line items than it does the total number of items. Um, because when you go in to deal with the items, you're going into another interface. And even though it may be like, say you have 10 copies, um, so 10 total items in one line item, all of that information doesn't populate into the purchase order other than counters. Um, so you don't actually see all the information. Well, you see some information, but not all of the information and not all of the ways to edit the information in that initial purchase order interface, you see that in the, the editor when you click through. So 
um, it is more to do with the lines of the number of line items in a PO than it is the total number of items um, represented by those line items. Um, it looks like there was a chat question in feed loops about ghost line items and in invoices. Um, I have never experienced that before, but I'm going to play around with making really long PO names and see what I can uh, see what I can yeah. do to figure out what's going on there because I have not run into that in the past. Um, but if anyone else has, I'm curious what's going on there. Um, okay, so. We've looked at price missing, basically missing information. The next thing I want to look at is what happens when you run into a closed fund. Um, and the reason that I wanted to bring this up specifically is because when I go into a purchase order that um, that has a closed fund as the reason it won't activate, the status that I get is that my fund exceeds the stop percent. So when you're setting up your funds, you have the ability to set um, basically a percentage of the total amount on that fund at which purchase orders won't activate anymore. And so, you know, some libraries may set this at 100% from the beginning. Some libraries may sort of change this throughout the year so that they can spread their funds out over the course of the year. Um, some libraries don't set it at all. And if you don't set it at all, it does allow you to go into the negative on a fund. Um, but what happens if you have, say, a fund that has a total of $10,000 um, allocated to it and it has a balance stop of 98%, it means that once you've spent $9,800, I think that math is right, um, on that fund, no one else can activate a PO that has a line item on that fund. And this is what you get when that happens. Um, and so this, you can change this or fix this by you know, changing that percentage, you can allocate more money to that fund if you have it. Um, you can also switch to a different fund if that's possible. So there are a lot of different ways to deal with that. And fortunately, one of the other things that can cause this status to come up is if a fund has been closed. So at the end of your fiscal year, one of the things you do is go through and close all of your active funds and basically propagate them as new funds for the next fiscal year. And if you've done that and you still have a PO that has items on it that have not yet, or you have a PO that has not yet been activated, you will not be able to activate that PO. So at NC Cardinal, one of the things that we tell our libraries using acquisitions is before they do any of their end of year closeout, they need to go through all their purchase orders and anything that has not yet been activated needs to either be activated or deleted so that it can be recreated next year. Um, so that's actually what's happening here. And it's confusing because that's not necessarily clear based on what's happening in this status. Now, if you're very detail oriented, you may notice that the, that the year is 2024 and you may know, oh, we're already on the 2025 fiscal year. So that's probably what's going on, but you may not realize that, or, you know, because fiscal years don't match with calendar years, most of the time it may not click. So sometimes that can be a little bit tricky to kind of, um, elucidate what's going on there. So that's why I wanted to show you this particular one. Um, in this case, I would have to go into um, these items and then I could go into the fund itself and I can see I've got this training FIC 24 as my current fund, knowing that that is not correct. I'd wanna switch it up to training FIC uh, from 2025. And doing that would allow me to eventually be able to activate this. Jennifer uh, Pringle has a comment in chat um, that you can also set up the stop percentage uh, to a percentage that's greater than 100% if you want to over encumber. And we do have several libraries that do that. Um, that is that is a com an additional complexity that may be very meaningful in, in a library. And you can definitely do it. Um, but just know what you're doing when you're doing it. Why, why do I want to over encumber a fund? Um, there are very legitimate reasons for doing it, but not just to make that purchase order activatable. <laughs> yes, that's probably not a way that um, anyone doing your bookkeeping wants you to make that activatable. Um, 
All right, so the final thing in terms of purchase orders that won't activate um, that I wanted to show you is if there's no bib record at all. So this is something that can happen uh, for a variety of different reasons. In NC Cardinal, we do a lot of merging. I imagine that's probably the same for other consortia as well. Um, so this can happen as a result of merging. It's um, also something that can happen if, so for example, there is a bib record that only has one item applied to it, and then somebody is going to order um, order a new copy of that for their library, and then the original single item attached to that gets deleted prior to the PO being activated. And that very special set of circumstances, this can also happen, but I think it's more common when there's a merging issue. Um, so basically what's kind of odd about this is that we're looking at a purchase order that has a status of pending activatable. As far as I can tell, there's no reason I shouldn't be able to activate this. But when I go to activate it, I'm bumped into an upload screen. So, you know, maybe this isn't so weird. Maybe I didn't, uh, I didn't create a bib record for this originally. Um, and so I'm expecting this, but if I originally had this link to something and I'm being bumped into this screen, it's going to make me think there's something odd going on. So if I return back to the actual line item and I look at it, I can see over here that there's something odd. So typically speaking, um, this here should just say catalog. And if I click on it, it should take me into the bib record. Because it says linked to catalog, that's my clue that this is actually not linked to a current bib record. Um, if you think about the cataloging structure within Evergreen, you have bib records, call numbers and copies, and you can't have a copy that's not attached to a record. You know, there can't just be random copies floating around that have no bib record. Um, so we can create our copy and call number as part of our line item an item creation here, but it has to be connected to a bib record to do anything else with it. Um, currently, because this says link to catalog, it's not attached to a bib record, which means that this whole line item is just kind of an orphan. There's nothing for it to latch on to. So before we can move forward, we have to get this attached to a line item or to a bib record. And I can do that by clicking activate and uploading a bib record if I have one. But I can also do it manually by clicking this link to catalog link. And this is going to pop up this search interface for me. Um, it's already pre-filled with all of my, you know, metadata from my item. And if I click submit, it's going to bring me to the bib record that it thinks is the best match for it. Um, so I could view this and I could make sure that it really does match what I, what I have, um, what I'm purchasing. And if it does, I can choose link. And so now I'm seeing, instead of link to catalog, I'm just seeing catalog. And if I click on this, it's gonna take me into a bib record. Um, so I don't think that's a super common thing that happens, but it can happen as the result of merging. Um, if you do have access to the database, you can kind of go back through and figure out, well, what was this merge to and figure out the best copy to, or the best uh, record to attach it to. Um, and that, but, you know, you can also just re-upload and that's going to sort of redo the merging process that you had um, originally done to the, to the record that eventually got deleted. All right, does that one make sense? Do people kind of follow everything on this sort of non-activatable purchase order section? And that's a chance to kind great. of- What's that? Yes. Okay, here, I thought it was great. Oh, um, well, and I will say here, just to clarify about the size of purchase orders, is there a limit of how many line items you can have on a purchase order before the system times out and doesn't activate if there are only one or two copies per line? Um, so there is not a defined limit on that. And it really has to do with system resources. Um, and I did, did just do a, a quick like gander through um, one of our libraries and they are keeping theirs below um, 100, but we have seen significantly more than that in terms of the line items. Um, but it, it works out for them to do that. They also, 
they order things actually on a bit of a daily basis and and they use EDI, which it makes it very um, efficient for them to do that. So I'll take that for what it's worth. But it looks to be about 100 is where they're keeping it, which works for them. But not, there is not a defined limit. Um, it has, and it is very flexi dependent on um, what your system resources are. Meaning your computer actually, <laughs> because of course this is rendering in a browser. And so that is um, one of the things that plays into All right. So um, I did earlier say that we'd be spending some time looking at how holdings definitions impact a lot of these issues. And that's what we're going to do now, um, because I'd say um, non-activatable purchase orders as a whole is probably the most common, but mark records that won't load is just a single bullet point here, but it's the second most common. Um, so we're going to take a look at what happens when you're mark when you're trying to create a purchase order using the mark uploader and it won't load um, as a result of incorrect holdings definitions. So when you have your holdings definitions, there are two things that could happen. You could either just not have them in there, and as a result, you're not creating items when you're uploading your records. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that could have caused uh, that earlier issue, the activation issue where we didn't have items attached. You can also have incorrect information included in your holdings definitions that Evergreen doesn't know what to do with and therefore doesn't do anything with it. Um, and so one of the things that can happen is that you simply fail to upload your, your records. So that's what I'm going to make happen now, I hope. Um, so this is what our load mark order records interface looks like. It's very similar to the cataloging one, um, but there are a couple of differences and I'm going to point those out. Um, the main thing that I'm doing here is that I'm creating a purchase order as part of my upload. So I have this section up here for creating that purchase order. So I need to choose my provider. Actually, I think this is Baker and Taylor. Um, and then I choose my ordering agency. Until I'm nervous. Uploading has a tendency to fail on me when I try to do it live like this. Um, I'm not going to create a selection list from this, but I am going to create a purchase order. I am not going to activate that purchase order. So this is the part that's really different than what you're doing with the cataloging uploader because you're setting up all of this information about how um, the upload is going to go into the purchase order. Um, but down here, it's very similar. So I'm going to choose my record source, my match set. And for my merge profile, we have one set up for orders. Um, so this knows what to look at in terms of holdings definitions. Um, I'm going to choose to import non-matching rec records, merge on best match, and then I'm going to choose to load items for imported records. Finally, I'm going to create my queue. And I'm going to choose my file. And now these, just like the, the cataloging one, um, these do need to be an MRC file, um, a mark edit mnemonic, or I'm sorry, a binary mark. Um, so I'm gonna upload this and what should happen, yep, I got an upload error. So the reason that I got this upload error is because my holdings definitions were incorrect. And it's telling me this by saying that there's no fund with this code found. Now there's more than one error in my um, in my mark record, but the one that it's really having trouble with is the code for the fund. Because when you're setting up those holdings definitions, you're basically tying it to specific codes that are already saved with an evergreen. And one of those is the code associated with the fund that you will be drawing on for this purchase. So let's take a look at what those, these holdings definitions actually look like when you're setting them up. 
Um, let's see, I have a training provider. Actually, I think I have a link straight to it. And I'll just give a shout out to you for uh, the settings that you selected for the upload. Uh, those are kind of my go-to settings as well um, to import non-matching records, merge on best match, and then load the items. Of course, your item, as you say, your your holdings definitions need to uh, align. Yeah, if you're going to load the items, you have to have the items correctly mm -hmm. defined. Um, I will say I did not include this in the list, but one of the common things that we've seen, especially with libraries that are new to acquisitions, when they're seeing failures, it has more than once turned out to be that they forgot to check that box for load for the loading items. Um, so that's a really important key piece of this. That's why I shouted it out because <laughs> that is exactly, I have done it so many times that I'm like, that's the thing, that one right there, that's my mistake. All right, so this is where you would set up your holdings definitions. Um, it's set up at the provider level. So theoretically, you can have different holdings definitions for different providers. I recommend you don't do that because it gets confusing, but you can. Um, and basically, this is just where you determine what mark field am I looking at, uh, or is Evergreen looking at when it's determining my holdings, and then what are the subfields for each different piece. So uh, NC Cardinal uses 961 for acquisitions holdings. This is different than what we use for our cataloging holdings definitions. Those are 852. I don't know that other consortium follow that same um, that same separation, but that we do them differently just to sort of cut down on confusion. Once I've done that, then I can create holding subfields for every single different piece. So I have a dropdown uh, that allows me to determine um, all of the different things that I could include. Um, you know, your circulation modifier is going to be important, your estimated price, your fund code. Uh, and, and your, your owning, owning library. library. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I could set my owning library to A. And so now when I get a MARC record, it should have uh, 961 subfield A and then my owning library's short name, exactly as Evergreen has it stored, including case, it is case sensitive. So if you don't have that right, um, you're gonna have a failure to upload just like we saw. Um, and so, you know, you don't necessarily need to include everything that is in those dropdowns, but you do need your owning library, your circ mod, um, your price, your fund code. Um, I think that those are, in your shelving location. Shelving location. I knew there was one yeah. more. Yeah. Um, and so this is where you would want to set that up in Evergreen. Of course, you're also going to want to set it up on the vendor side so that when they give you the records, it matches. Um, I'm not going to do that right now, um, but that's what you would do like in your Ingram grid when you're setting that up. You're going to want to make sure that it matches with what you have set up on this end. And, and if it sounds arbitrary um, and like you're missing something or like I'm missing the thing it is arbitrary the the what the only thing that really matters well there are two things first of all you have to keep track of it and i i like that you you pointed out samantha about having the 852 for holdings information for catalog records and 961 for um acquisitions records again that's kind of arbitrary ish but it does help you like keep track of what's what I can look and see if I have holdings information in a 52 catalog record 961 it's an on order record. But what is not arbitrary is that what your vendor has there has to match what you have in evergreen doesn't matter how it matches it just has to be a for a B for B. Whatever for whatever. You can choose what you want, but you have to make sure that that choice is consistently applied once you've made it. Elizabeth has a great uh, comment in here too. Uh, fund codes are case sensitive uh, and make sure you don't have any spaces if you're copying and pasting, uh, including those, um, the ending spaces that are easy to uh, get in there and you don't see them because they're at the end. So um, make sure to. <laughs> yeah. Another thing with that is also the fund code when it shows up like in a purchase order has the year in parentheses after it. 
that does not go in the holdings definition. You don't want yeah. to include the year. Um, that has thrown off a number of attempts to activate a purchase order. Yeah, and don't feel like you have to add that year in parentheses. That's auto. It's auto generated. Yes. Yeah. Um, all right. I've done that. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Let's see. Yes. Yeah, we so set Jennifer... up the standard for the subfield codes to use for our entire consortium, and so far, haven't found a vendor that can't use the codes we specified makes troubleshooting easier when all of the subfields are mapping the same. I think that that's fantastic. Yeah, we have a similar thing at NC Cardinal that uh, we have standards. Um, I think that there are a couple of like older ones out there um, that don't match the standards. Um, but for the most part, like anything that's set up now matches that same. So yeah, in Evergreen, it's Indiana, it's the Wild West. We have no standards around that. So, uh, and I don't advocate that. Um, but we we didn't have a um, we didn't have a coordinated rollout of acquisitions, and so when that doesn't happen, then it gets a little wild westy. At some point, there will probably be some uh, reining in of that and some standards applied. It works with or without, but keeping in mind that where there are standards and there's lots of freedom, that's where you get your complexity that it starts to look a lot like chaos. So good on NC Cardinal <laughs> and uh, BC Co-op for reigning in the chaos beforehand. Now we're getting close to time. So I'm gonna rush through the last ones. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time fixing them, but I just wanna show you some other things that could happen. Um, so in this one, um, I'm showing you the actual bib record and the holdings within it, because what has happened is that these are two unique holdings that both uh, refer to the same physical item. What happened here is that an acquisitions uh, holding was created, and you can tell that because it has this placeholder. This is, uh, we talked earlier about the idea that you can auto-generate call numbers and barcodes. That's what, that's what this looks like. We now have a call number that starts with ACQ and a barcode that starts with ACQ. And then we have a second um, item here that has, in this case, it is quite clearly a fake call number and a fake barcode. Um, but um, for the sake of this presentation, it's the real call number and the real barcode. What happened here was a miscommunication between the upload in the acquisitions module and the upload in the cataloging module. So I'm gonna really quickly show you if we go into the mark batch import, over here in the mark batch import, we have this auto overlay in process acquisitions item. If you are doing that second upload that we talked about, you must check this box. If you don't check this box, you'll get duplicate holdings. If you do check this box, you still might get duplicate holdings because when you are um, uploading and trying to overlay, um, Evergreen's gonna check for three things. First, it's going to check the owning library that's listed in, in this case, my 852 in my cataloging um, holdings definition. It's going to check that owning library and say, does this owning library have a, a record for this item that originated via acquisitions? If yes, then is that record currently, has it been um, received? Has somebody gone in and manually marked it as received? If yes, then it's going to say, is its status currently on order? And if yes, then it's going to overlay that holding. So it's basically going to put the correct barcode and call number on the existing holding that was created as part of your acquisitions hold, um, upload. If any of those three is a no, it's going to create a new holdings record, which means if you fail to mark your item received, you'll get a duplicate. If for whatever reason you've changed the owning branch, between the point of purchasing and the point of cataloging, and that is being reflected in your holdings definition in the catalog record, you're gonna get a duplicate. And if you have for some reason changed the status of the item that you bought through acquisitions from on order to anything else, you're gonna get a duplicate. So you basically have to be really careful that your owning library matches, that you have marked an item received before uploading your new catalog record and that you have not touched the status of that item. 
because all three of those things need to be correct in order to overlay. Um, otherwise, you end up with, uh, with this duplicate um, holdings information. Um, you can also get duplicates if somehow a cataloger decides to manually add a holding that was purchased through acquisitions. This is a little rarer, but if you have miscommunication between your catalogers and your acquisition staff, this could happen. I know in a lot of libraries, there's pretty significant crossover between those people. Um, but if you have a really large system, this is something that you may want to make sure is included in uh, cataloger training. All right, so those are the common problems that I wanted to show you. I am going to talk very briefly about a couple of not so common problems. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that can go wrong in acquisitions. These are not the only completely oddball ones, but there's some that really, I think, give some insight into what's happening under the hood. Um, the first one is line items attached to merged or deleted bib records. And we actually kind of talked about that earlier. Um, but essentially, if a bib record gets deleted um, before it is, before the purchase order is activated, and I think we actually already fixed this, so it's not going to work. Um, but if a bib record is deleted before the uh, purchase order is activated, if I go into this catalog record, I think I'll see that it's blank. It is. I'm not going to be able to actually activate this um, because um, even though there is a link to the catalog, there's nothing in that link. So I would have to actually, um, I'd say the easiest way to fix this is probably by uploading a new bib record. Um, and so you're going to want to um, go into the actions menu and there is an option to load bibs and items from here. So you'll want to re-upload that bib record in order to sort of link it to a new one if that bib record got deleted. Um, now, if you are migrating a library in and, or you're a newly migrated library, and when you migrated, you brought your acquisitions info from your last ILS with you, and you had a um, purchase order that had a not, that had items that had not yet been received, they'd been purchased, but not received. Um, you cannot mark those received in Evergreen. It will stay in sort of this continual status of, of on order. Um, so here's an, I was not able to recreate this myself. So this is a real one. So I apologize for that. Um, but basically this is an item that was on a purchase order that was migrated over. And if I go into the actions menu, you'll see that mark received is not an option. I have no way to mark this received. Somebody who has um, direct access to the database and can actually make changes in that database. So basically, you know, your, your vendor, um, they can go in and actually fix this, but the library itself will not be able to. And if you are in a consortium like NC Cardinal, where you have sort of a first tier service level, most likely your first tier support is not going to be able to fix it either. It's probably going to have to go up another step. Um, but this is something to be aware of if you are migrating in or have migrated um, or are, you know, a consortium that is migrating libraries continuously, one of the things to think about is not migrating in purchase orders that have um, unreceived items on them, if possible. Mary has a, a comment about the deleted bib, and this is there, if you know the library's TCN or record ID, a database ID, you can go in through the cataloging tools and search for that, and then you can undelete it. Um, if if you have the right permissions to be able to do that, so cataloging permissions as well. Um, and I also referring to migrating acquisitions data, um, it can be done. Uh, I have been involved in um, with acquisitions libraries coming on in both things where we brought on acquisitions data and it was possible and it was not without fraughtness. <laughs> um, and then we also coordinated a way for an acquisitions library to come on without bringing their data um, and for them to essentially bring a portion of their fiscal year into the, the new um, implementation of Evergreen and to begin anew 
in Evergreen rather than bringing old line items and things from their previous ILS, which worked a lot. <laughs> Message. Yeah, okay. I, th I think um, my my recommendation would probably be to not bring over every little bit of acquisitions uh, data that you right. may have from your old ILS. Um, so Tiffany says we shouldn't even try to read an EDI message, um, but I'm going to show you how to anyway, really, 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 really briefly. I thought that that picture was um, the best picture I laughed when I saw it. <laughs> um, that's how I feel when I'm looking at EDI. So I felt like it was appropriate. Um, so basically, if you are looking at an EDI message in Evergreen, this is what you see. And that doesn't make much sense, does it? Um, so what I recommend that you do is if you have Notepad++, any text reader will work, but Notepad++ is probably the best one in terms of being able to manipulate it. You can either go into your EDI messages and your acquisitions administration, and you can pull out um, the text there and put it into your Notepad++. If you have database access, you can also do a SQL query and, and uh, export it. Um, that's usually how I do it. I, it's, I think, a little bit faster than going all the way through all of the different menu levels to get to the EDI messages. But either of those will work. Open it in Notepad++ and find and replace. And then you're going to replace um, your um, single quote with the expression backslash N. And that allows you, I think I can pull this up. Yeah, so that allows you to take this super unreadable thing. Is everybody seeing my my notepad? I hope. Yep. And I'm gonna just replace a single quote with backslash n, and now I can read it in blocks. Um, a couple of things to note in here: lin. That's gonna be um, the ISBN and the purchase order or the line item number, I'm sorry. Um, PIA is also your ISBN. Uh, your quantity is QTY. And REF plus LI, REF is your purchase order. And LTI, I believe, is your line item ID number. So you shouldn't need to read EDI messages that often, but when you do have to, it helps to do it this way, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you also have you know, other things. You've got your title, your publisher, and your publication date are gonna show up in this particular one. This is an orders one. Invoices will have some things that are different. Uh, where I have had to recently read a lot of EDI messages is dealing with the DES, ADV messages. Um, mm -hmm. And those also will have tracking numbers and container codes. So lots of fun. Okay, I'm going to be done now because it is 301. Okay. So Ruth, you may add anything you'd like to add, but I think I'm done. Okay, so a couple things. First of all, two tools that you need to have. You need to have Mark Edit and you need to have um, Notepad++ in addition, because they're great for manipulating uh, a lot of different things, obviously. Um, let's talk very briefly about Launchpad. You can just go on to the next slide. Um, so Launchpad, of course, is our ticket tracking system for Evergreen. You can find it at launchpad.net forward slash Evergreen. And um, I, I put on here because I, when I did a search for for all of the ACK tags, and you can go in there, and there's an advanced search, and you can search by tags. There were 319 um, tickets that open. And now, keeping in mind that tickets include not just things that are wrong, but also wish list things, um, development tracking, all sorts of things. So please uh, go in there, take a look. There was actually um, a link in chat from uh, from Jennifer, I believe. Oh, yeah, if you want to read the EDI message, add heat. So if there's something else in those launch pad tickets that you are interested in there, I mean, am I a nerd to like going through <laughs> launch pad tickets? Maybe, I don't know, but do it anyway. Add heat, um, subscribe to them so you see work that is done on them. Uh, Simone has a question. Sorry, continuation about the size of purchase orders. 
if your vendor using usually sends you a file. So this is exactly what I would say. I would recommend that uh, that you do break that, use Mark Breaker from Mark Edit to break that into um, smaller files and then use those to create um, different purchase orders from that one Mark or that one on order file that you got from your vendor. And that's where Mark Edit gets real nice in there. Um, so Launchpad 319, but there's lots of stuff in there that does not mean everything is broke. There's just a lot of communication. Documentation is, um, we didn't talk a lot about that right now, but all of the information that we have learned, and I know because I talked with Samantha about this and me as well, um, has been from documentation, both the general evergreen documentation that includes the daily workflow interfaces like purchase orders, line items, that type of thing, um, as well as the administration general documentation is available at docs.evergreen slash ils.org, but there's a link there and it's in the slides. Um, and then NC Cardinal, uh, Evergreen Indiana, Georgia Pines and Sitka all have um, open documentation that you are encouraged to steal from. Please do make it your own. We are working on this together. So, uh, and you're gonna see it differently and you're gonna like teach us. It does not matter um, how long you have been doing this. New perspectives, old perspectives all meet together and make something better. And then the acquisitions interest group. I am going to slow down because this is the most important thing right here. The acquisitions interest group, Tiffany has said in chat that we're meeting this Thursday, which is part of the Hackfest for this. It is so full of value for you to attend that. Um, they talk about launchpad tickets, so development, but also workflows and just bouncing ideas off of one another on how to make this work in such a way that is beneficial to our libraries and all of that. Uh, Question from Trisha Everett. If a mid-sized library were to take on all of the eighth act possibilities, how much time would it take? Would it be a full-time job? I have a suggestion, Trisha. Um, yes, if you were to take on all of those things, it would be a full-time job. Um, but I don't think that it's necessary to do that. Um, I am somebody that does like to maybe over-prepare. Um, I would give yourself a year to invest, investigate, um, have those conversations um, so that it's not just a full-time person, have those conversations uh, on staff, and then say, what does it take to get our bookkeeping in there and, our, and to start accounting for what we're spending on materials through acquisitions? And then the component, of course, we're adding um, records with items in there that patrons can place holds on. So we instantly have a value add. We have now some accounting-ish that's going on in the ILS as well as a way for patrons to place holds on things earlier. Then you Thank can you. start adding functionality to that um, as it seems appropriate, as it actually helps your workflows, things like that. I am a big proponent for taking a long time to plan small. So but that's just me. If you want to go all the way in, dive in hard, then yes, a full-time person, full person for um, a medium-sized library would be appropriate. But keep in mind also that a lot of this stuff is already being done just in outside the ILS. You know, you're already right. doing the selecting. You're already making the orders with your vendor. You're already uploading the bib records when you're getting them. You're just doing it at a different part of it. Um, somebody's already doing the bookkeeping. A lot of this is already happening maybe by a lot of different people. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, maybe it's one full-time person where it used to be five quarter-time people. Um, exactly. So, you know, but like Ruth said, planning is one of the best ways that you can also figure that out. You know, what jobs are being done by whom and how can that be adjusted if it's needed? And there's a comment here too from uh, Benjamin 
saying that we use EDI for ordering from one vendor. It's not very time consuming, just placing the orders through Evergreen and receiving the items. And that is another great tip um, that I wholeheartedly, you don't, you're not going to be able to honestly use EDI for all of your vendors. But if, if you can get started with acquisitions um, and don't start with EDI right away, but, the, but when you add EDI into just look, that one vendor, it's gonna free up a whole lot of time um, in there that you can now put towards either the other vendors, other things in there, or just, you know, other things in your library. And Ruth saying, Ruth Lord in chat is saying that it's easiest to start at the beginning of your fiscal year. Um, you want to start planning before that, but yes, I definitely recommend when you hit the switch to make it happen, that that coincides with the start of a fiscal year. It Absolutely. will make your life much happier. Otherwise, you're going to be doing some math um, that you didn't really want to do to prorate your funds and your funding sources. I mean, it's possible, but... But why do it if it's easier some other way? Okay, I think unless there are any more questions, I'm just kind of wandering through here. All right, that's all I have too. Yes. Um, I, oh, yeah, so EDI setup does take a long time. All the setup takes a long time. So be prepared mm -hmm. for setup itself to be a big project. Um, but once it's set up, a lot of it is. It flows. Yeah. Um, it's just that initial flows. setup can be a lot. Uh, and Kate, also, I will say too um, that. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to read your comment just a second. But, second but, uh, it can be very terrifying. The thing that I will. Um, always, always remind every single one that's listening, every single person that's listening, you are not alone in this. And there is absolutely like no barrier between our organizations and things like that when it comes to asking for recommendations, for help. Um, of course, we may have something going on, but uh, I know that there is a very giving spirit when it comes to support um, in the Evergreen community. Um, we are also not tracking funds. That's cool. Yes. And you also don't, you don't have to track real funds. That's why I kind of made that offhanded comment about these don't have to exist in the real world. Um, funds can be something that really does help you keep track of finances in your library. That may not actually be important to you. And if it is not important to you, then they're just a mechanism for you to buy things. And a lot of times your municipality, your county, whoever it is that gives you money doesn't want this to be how you're tracking funds. They're, they're yeah. going to want you to follow their system. So, And it is, it is no replacement for your bookkeeping software that is approved by your fiduciaries. Just FYI. Yeah. In case we needed I'd to say, have that. I'd say a lot of our libraries just use this as a, they put a guesstimate of how much money they expect they're going to spend in there just so that they can make everything work. But this is not how they do their bookkeeping. Absolutely. Absolutely not in terms of actual bookkeeping and accounting, but it, it is a way to, yeah, create some order out of chaos. Yes. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you for everybody to be here. And um, we'll probably be around all week. -ish. Yes. I'm happy to talk about this if people have more questions. Absolutely. But thank you have for everybody who stuck around for an extra 12 minutes, too. We knew it was going to go long. Yeah, I, I didn't kid myself. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Bye. Thank you, everyone. The next session starts at 3.30.